What seemed to be a beautiful evening in Inverness, Florida, turned downright scary when a teenager made a frantic call to a 911 dispatcher. He said that his mother was lying on her side and struggling to breathe, and there was an axe in her skull that was buried three-fourths of the way. In shock over the scene Carlos just saw, he ran outside and screamed for help. He had attended a family friend's funeral with his mother earlier in the day. When they got home, they slept soundly at their lake house, unaware of the nightmare that was about to become reality. Denise was lying on her side when medical professionals started performing CPR on her. They were unable to shift her onto her back due to the angle of the axe. Sadly, doctors were unable to revive her. On July 13th, 2019, Denise Hallowell was pronounced dead that evening. But why would somebody want to kill her? According to neighbors, Denise's life was quite simple and private. Her only family was her son Carlos, whom she had adopted. They couldn't picture anyone who would harbor enmity towards Denise until Carlos gave them a useful piece of information. His younger brother named Angel hadn't visited the home in four years. Angel was the second child that Denise had adopted, but something was troubling Angel, due to which he once ran away from home. Denise once dialed 911 after another attempt at a runaway in 2016, when Angel was 12 years old. After this incident, things went from bad to worse. Responding officers were shocked to discover that Angel's room's door was chained and his windows were boarded and nailed shut. The only things in his room were books, an air mattress on a metal frame, and a bucket to use for urinating and defecating into. Angel reported Denise's alleged physical and verbal abuse to a caseworker. He said she forced him to clean the bathroom while naked. Angel was found to have scratches on his face as well as bruising on his hips and arms. Denise was detained immediately. Carlos, on the other hand, asserted that Angel was making everything up. In reality, Angel was the one who had abused her mother. Denise spent two weeks in jail before being released, but her life wasn't back to normal when she returned home. Due to claims of child abuse, she was forced to resign from her teaching job, and both of her sons were transferred to foster care. Angel ran away from the foster home, and as Angel was a minor, his records were sealed for his safety. Denise had Carlos back in her care after five months and signed away her rights to Angel. Life seemed to be going well without Angel. Carlos and Denise's friends all attested to the fact that Angel was violent and unpredictable. So when Denise was murdered, suspicions increased. The detective's conversations with Denise's neighbors revealed that there had been some strange activities going on. Animals were going missing, and cars were pulling in and out of the neighborhood frequently. Weird things have been happening in my neighborhood. Weird, awful things. My cat got literally cut in half and laid on my lawn. When he was watching my chickens while we were on vacation, we came home and there was a chicken on our front door with the claw of a hammer in its um, body, dead. As additional information started to emerge from many sources, the investigators started to piece together a clearer picture of Denise's difficult life. While Angel had been known as a problematic child, Carlos had his own issues. He had been spending too much time partying hanging out with girls a lot and not doing well enough in school to meet Denise's expectations. In January 2016, Carlos and Denise got into a fight over bringing girls into the house and selling drugs. Carlos became more violent and went outside to damage his mother's pickup truck and eventually made an attempt to take his own life. Carlos went to stay with his friends, Stephanie and Damien, in May 2019. His girlfriend said that he had seemed happy because they were more understanding than Denise. Denise frequently stopped by Stephanie's home during Carlos's stay to have sit-down conversations that turned into fights, some of which were recorded by Stephanie. When you know he doesn't have a job, why are you asking him for money? He has a job. He told me he has a job with you guys. Okay, he says he's before that he did it. it. And you were harassing him. How much was she originally saying you owed like 600 bucks? All the time working. Well, we have to come up with, uh, now I gotta come up with breaks of paying for something. No. Why is that my fault? Shut up! Why is he paying for shut breaks? Shut up and I'll pay answer. You the shut money. up! You break your What did I tell you today? I don't know, you said pay the phone bill. And then you're gonna charge. Why does he have to pay a phone bill? Shh. Because it's his He's a child. 
There you go. She sees you as a child. All you scream and want to be seen as an adult. No, no I said I want to be treated. A child. I said I want to be treated Teenager. as my age. You're so, the one that keeps calling them an adult. I recorded you. They've so, heard you so talk. So we've got you now. Right. You are in their house. They've so? seen you talk. And now Stephanie's seeing how you talk to me. No, I, I don't care. The description of Denise's actions here reveals her mental distress. It's common for parents who abuse their own children to either have APD themselves or have antisocial traits. Denise eventually wanted Carlos to return home, but he was reluctant because they frequently quarreled over money and how much or little he had given to the household. After giving it some thought, Carlos finally told Denise that the only condition for him to move back in with her was if she agreed to his list of requirements and have it notarized by a bank. He was asking her to cover the cost of a car, housing, and other living expenses. Just over a month before Denise was killed on June 12th, Carlos moved back in with his mother after leaving Stephanie's house, but they continued to have loud fights that could be heard by neighbors. The increasing bad behavior of Carlos and the potential for a more dangerous turn of events worried Denise's friends deeply. After the murder, investigators found his journal, which has a different story than the neighbors. He expressed his love for his mother in his journal and begged her to return. Given the circumstances of Angel's separation from the family, the idea that Angel was the one to swing the axe was a simple one. Everyone agreed that the only person who might be seeking revenge was him. Detectives then received shocking information that 15-year-old Angel was imprisoned for an armed robbery, even though the robbery charges had not been verified by any official sources or documents, it is believed that he was behind bars when Denise was killed. He was cleared from the case immediately. However, Carlos started telling his friends what he had seen the night of his mom's death, and his accounts of what had happened were suspicious. Then uh, I kept saying that you know, his, his mom has a few acres in a couple other states. I don't know if that's true or not. But he said when he turns 18, he's probably going to move to one of them in North Carolina. So he's like, yeah, man, you know, it, it sucks what happened, but, you know, like, I can't wait to to get that as far as, like, the land and the cars and all that stuff. And he also had, like, no remorse. He had no problem telling me whatever. After reviewing the case, the police made a surprising observation regarding Carlos's first interrogation. He seemed to be lacking emotion for someone who had just discovered their mother with an axe in their head. In addition, he was disrespectful and condescending to the detectives. What I say is, if I'm going to open a door and the dogs are there, they'll go crazy and barking until the door's open. I'm not going to open the door and run off. Your, your house is in the middle of nowhere, so me to like, explain that if I'm going to open a door, I can't, I can't run that fast with the dogs. In the I don't know. You guys are detectives. Aren't you supposed to figure this out? The no. doors are open on the side. The gate doors are open, so the dogs are everywhere and the front door is still open. So I have no idea how it got there. I want to know how it got there, and I don't want to know why. I do not know, and I want to know. Because for some reason, my dogs have been let out where they won't bark and won't do anything because they run off. As soon as they're out of that gate, they will run off because that is the only time they get outside of that gate. So I don't know what you guys are trying to get out of me right now, but I didn't do anything and would never do anything to my mother like that. As much as we, uh, we used to bicker and, and get back at each other, fighting sometimes, and then peace, and then back, back and forth, and then peace again, never. Never in a million years would I ever think to do that. She's my mom. I was adopted at age four, and I've been with her forever. Carlos was showing the common features of a person with APD. His lack of emotion about the death of his mother may be a sign that he lacks empathy. On top of the suspicions already growing against Carlos, he also claimed that there were no operational security cameras, only a broken one outside the house. However, a manual for a different type of security camera was right there in plain sight, next to the cables that had been displaying three active security cameras. Now, Carlos was under suspicion. Investigators were confident that they were close to cracking the case. The digital forensics team got to work and analyzed Carlos's phone activity. It showed that Carlos used his phone constantly while he was at home, including throughout the murder. This contradicted his claim in his version of events that he was asleep when the crime was committed. Carlos started to realize he could no longer pretend to be innocent. He admitted that he walked into the house to get a glass of water, but instead entered his mother's room, turned his head away, 
and swung the axe into her head. On September 14th, 2021, Carlos Hallowell made a court appearance. He was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole for first-degree murder. Surprisingly, Carlos doesn't argue about his life sentence and accepts it. He said in a jailhouse interview, quote, You take a life, you owe a life.